Hi everybody, thank you for coming. This is Exploiting Vulnerabilities Through Proper Reconnaissance with Ben Stegapore. By day, Ben works as the Hacker Operations Lead at HackerOne, the number one most popular bug bounty platform, and is a hacker by night. Prior to joining HackerOne, he has helped identify and exploit over 500 security vulnerabilities across hundreds of web and mobile applications for companies such as Yahoo, Airbnb, Snapchat, the US Department of Defense, Yelp, GitHub, and more. Please welcome Ben. Everyone, so again, my name is Ben Today Report. Uh, as I mentioned, I work at Hacker One uh, during the daytime, and at the time I do hacking, plant testing, bug bounty, whatever other names you consider that first line. Uh, I found about 600 bugs on Hacker One to over 100 programs, uh, and I also co founded a company, uh, a community called Bug Bounty Forum. The Bug Bounty Forum, we pretty much connect all the bug bounty hunters together. We publish tools, AMAs, uh, QAs, and resources for people to get started in bug bounty scene. So if you guys are interested in getting started in bug bounties, please go ahead and check us out. It's bugbountyforum.com. Um, and just click around and see all the stuff we have. So for today, I'm going to talk about uh, recon. Um, if you guys were at my talk last year, I'm sorry. It's pretty much the same thing, but it's, it's just a lot of more material added to it. Um, but I'm going to have to go through them a little bit quicker because I have more material than I expected in 30 minutes. So if I show stuff that's on there, you want to take a note, they will all be on, uh, on one of my social media accounts, like GitHub or Twitter or something like that. So if you wanted to get a hold of those uh, material, just go on GitHub and you can see it now if you like uh, any of the code or anything like that. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about asset discovery, content discovery. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit of automation, and then I enjoy doing the whole dumpster diving thing digitally. It's probably been the number one money maker for me so far this year. Uh, so we'll talk about that and some of the examples. And then I'll show actual examples of some of the programs that I worked on uh, that ended up paying. So why do I do bug bounties? Uh, for me, it's the self-improvement part. It's a challenge to learn something new almost every day. Uh, either it's by reading someone else's blog, uh, finding my own cool techniques, or keep learning from somebody else, or going to all these amazing talks. I like the networking uh, part of it, and I'm not kidding when I say I, my career was 100% built around bug bounties. I got my first outside job at uh, local in this area in Hulu. I'm just doing bug bounties and sending them a bug. Uh, and then the next thing I reached out to them and I asked them if you guys hired me. And they hired me. Yeah. And then I moved on to other things. So 100% of it was built just because I was doing bug bounties pretty much. I also like the competition part. Uh, my buddy and I, you've seen we are going head to head for, we're trying to get to the top 10. So we're battling for 11 and 12 back and forth. We really need once in a while. Um, so that's also another uh, big part of doing the whole competition part. It keeps us motivated um, and it results in better bugs. I also would like to make a little bit of extra cash. Um, it's a great way to do it. It takes a while. It's an investment of your time. But if you put in the time and effort, then you can definitely make a good amount of money. Um, as much as I hate to say it, sometimes I make more than this than I do any other jobs. So recon, the recon idea, if you're in the military, is pretty much what you try to seek out and see what areas outside your friendly zones, what's happening in those areas. And it's kind of the same when you're doing it in bug bounty. You kind of want to understand what is going on with an application, how is it uh, processing data, um, what are all the possible entry points. So it could be your endpoint, it could be a post, whatever that is. So you want to get gather all that information uh, all at once as fast as possible and you want to save time while you're doing it. And a lot of the things you do during this process is very, you're always repeating the same commands over and over. So eventually we'll talk about how we can cut down the times and how we can pretty much raise our profit. Um, so our return, of, our return of investment is going to go high and all the other things. And again, like, one of the things that I've seen some of the hackers say is, like, for example, now is a tweet from two years ago, but some of us spend more time doing recon than actual hacking. But you don't have to do that. It's just we have found a way of enjoying doing the recon. It's been something that we like to do and learn about the target before we even get into the whole process. So this is pretty much the guide that I use for recon. Um, this is also you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is what I usually use for not a checklist really, but it's my methodology. It's pretty much in three different areas. The top two are always connected because you want to find all the assets. 
then you want to do the same thing and do content discovery. But what happens when you're not getting enough stuff in the top part? You want to go to the second portion, the portion, or do it all together at once. Um, so asset discovery. Again, so for this chapter of the talk, we'll talk about the asset discovery through sub uh, domain brute force and search transparency. So this was all in the part of the talk, but there's more methods and there's more things on it too. So what do you do? You brute force for um, for subdomains. You can use all these great tools that are on the right. They're all pretty much the same thing, different ways. Um, what do you do? You, you just give it a word list. Those are all the subdomains that are available in that company. And then once you find those, you start brute forcing again for different uh, permutations or different environments. So the example for what the different permutations and uh, different environment means is sometimes it's dashboard.dev.site.com versus you want to find dashboard-dev.site.com and there is, you can find all those applications if you're going after the different environments and applications. But all of that stuff is fun, but this is super boring because just sitting there looking at a tool just giving you output and output, like line after line after line. And sometimes it's very exhausting, it takes a very long time. And there's a lot of domains that dashes and random characters and letters in there, but you can't find those with a dictionary word, right? Uh, so what do you do? I rely on certificate transparency. If something matters to an organization, they're going to get it a certificate. That's what it does. So what do you do? Um, there are tools out there. Uh, this is the one that I've talked to in the past is Census. Census is pretty much uh, scanning and pulling certificates from every IP address out in the world, and they're indexing it. Um, you can do some filtering. It's pretty cool. I don't rely on the filtering on census as much, but I rely on it to find some really cool subdomains like the ones from Snapchat. Um, if you can't see that, the subdomain on there is pretty much um, Snapchat payment gateway. I don't have Snapchat in my dictionary, uh, the, the word list that I use. So this would have been very hard for me to find if it wasn't for a um, search transparency tool. But there's also other tools like Shodan. This is the... Um, another tool you can use, same thing, they pretty much scan the entire web. Um, they've port scanned it, they've indexed a lot of things. But the best part about it is how I can filter through different things, right? So if I want to look at a specific host name, I can do that by giving it the host name value. If I want to go after the organization without just the web, and I want to go after all the IP spaces, I could do an organization. I could uh, combine all of those. I can go after an organization, a separate um, a product like Tomcat, or I can look by title, looking for login pages, admin pages, whatever that is. Um, and again, uh, Shodan has its own values. If you go to college, apparently you get a free Shodan, and some of my friends are going to school for the wrong reasons. Um, but yeah, so you can get a free account. It's 40 bucks to get it, and it's honestly worth every penny. And if you're using this actively, it pays off for itself. 40 bucks isn't any, a lot of money, but the investment is pretty well. Um, there's also Search Spotter. I absolutely love using Search Spotter because I don't. I like to live in the console sometimes and not have to tab out of it. Um, so with Search Spotter, you just do a curl to their site. Um, the image right there is what it gives you when you just hit their API. But you can also use a little bit of JQ and some setting, and you can get all the values on the right. So I'll show the code for this in a little bit during uh, the automation phase. There's also Search SH. The best part about Cert SH is the fact that you can actually use a wildcard. So if I wanted to look for every domain that Uber owns, for example, if I wanted to own, look for uber.com.net.org, all those different uh, extensions, you can do that. So for the image on the left, I did, uh, I wrote Hacker One, sorry. It's supposed to be Snapchat. Um, so I looked for Snapchat and everything that, you know, I wanted to do dot, 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 Snapchat, dot, whatever. So I can see dot com, dot pizza, dot properties, um, different other domains. And then you can also do um, hit their API again. You just have to give it an and output equals JSON, and that kind of gives you uh, a whole lot of lists. And you can see for just this source itself, it gave me 136 unique uh, domains on Facebook. It's about three pages if you have your entire page maximized. That's another source. I, I use certain SH for different things. So I don't rely on one. Uh, if I'm pulling subdomains for certificate transparency search engines, I'm hitting every single one of them besides Shodan and Census because they thought it's a good idea to charge people um, after you hit a certain limit. Um, so we're boycotting that. Um, OSINT, so the search transparency thing is kind of OSINT, but at the same time, there's other ways you can gather information about your target. So Aaron and looking at the acquisitions are the next part for me. Um, so I go on Aaron, oh, sorry, acquisitions first. So you can go to... Uh, Crunchbase, you can actually type in the company's name and see all the acquisitions they own. This is great for a company like Google, 
Facebook, uh, Yahoo sometimes that have, they, they tell you pretty much, hey, everything we own is in our scope of our bug bounty program. You can go hack on them. As long as it's been six months or more that we have acquired them, you're more than welcome to go find bugs on them. So you can do this. You, you do this part. You get all the list of the domains. You go back to the slides from the asset discovery. You do the same thing, but you also look at IP addresses. This is when things get a better. Th this is when things get a little bit more interesting because not only some of these companies are using domains to host things, they also have IPs that don't have a host name assigned to them. So what you want to do is you want to find all of those. So when you go to Aaron, you type in for Yahoo. It brings up the customer and it tells you your organization. You click on the org. It gives you information about the company itself. You click on the related networks, and the related networks give you the range of all the IP addresses, which makes it easy for us so we don't have to look for different sources to find these, right? You can also do that on Shodan. You can just go in and type in org is Yahoo, or you can actually just give it the IP range, and it gives you the results that they have in the database. But you have to remember, Shodan and Census aren't doing this constantly. They're doing it every couple of weeks, every couple of months. So the data could be old. That IP address that was on Amazon may have been assigned from Yahoo to some random company I've never heard of. So keep that in mind when you're doing the uh, all these different engines. Uh, but going to the source of itself and finding Aaron the actual IP addresses that they own makes it a little bit easier. They're not going anywhere. You just have to end map them and start pulling the information from it. So content discovery is where I spend a lot of my time. Um, the content discovery idea is pretty much to do, you, you want to get a visual uh, image of what the application looks like. You want to do a port scan. You can, you're more than welcome to scan every 65,000 port that's out there, or you can just do some of the common ports that you have collected as you have done your work on different programs or different companies. And then you also want to do a brute force for directory and files, and then you want to do some uh, JavaScript, uh, which is kind of messy, but we'll, we made it a little bit easier this year. Uh, so again, I talked about port scanning, you screenshot. Uh, I usually do port 80 and 443. Don't ask me why, but some companies like to serve different content on different ports. So for that reason, I'm taking a screenshot and I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. You can add ports 8443, 8080, 7443, 3000, whatever you want to do. Um, but by default, because I want to do this really, really fast, I'm trying to do the minimum amount. If something piques my interest, then I will go and do more and dig into it more. So again, we look for those. Um, those are the IP, uh, sorry, those are the port numbers that I usually look for. It's about 20 of them, I want to say. And then I also use webscreenshot.py. You give it a list, and it pretty much takes a screenshot really, really quickly for you and puts them in the folder. And then I also use our directory file brute force. All of those on the right are really good tools. I just use their search just because it's in Python. It's easier. It's maintained. Um, it's just been the easiest one to use. And it has a lot of different options, so I'll check it out for sure if I was to go and look for directory brute forcing tools. Um, also, robot.cxc does a job for you sometimes. I've found admin folders in some companies that they wanted to hide it from people, from it not getting indexed, but they just flat out put it on the robots.txt, and there was no authentication sometimes. So check that out sometimes. It might give you some information and save you some time. Um, so I always, also, one of the things that I do is I keep all the archives of my scans. I think I have, like, 30,000 scans on my box just sitting. Um, this is just from the past year of scanning stuff. The reason I do that is, first of all, you want to do the differences between the two times you scan the property. There's something new get launched. Or also the other thing is, what if you find a vulnerable endpoint on company A, but they're using a software that has a known vuln that you missed on other targets that you've been hacking on you know, last year? So by doing that, I can just go and start gripping through things. So for example, I come across a JMX console I went, oh, well, I wonder if there's more instances of the JMX console or the Tomcat instance where on the same target that I have missed. So for the first time, it said 172. I called bullshit. So I did a little bit better. I went back and said, okay, let's do manager HTML. Let's see how, how many of those came out as 401. How many of them actually required you to have a authentication? And that gave me a better result, nine. Out of those nine, I was, exp I was able to exploit three of them with admin admin, and I got uh, a full-blown RCE pretty much at that point. So you want to keep your archives. It helps, believe me. I know it takes a lot of space. Pay the $5 a month from whatever um, cloud company you use. The $5 is well worth it to keep all that data. Um, get rid of it as you're making more and more. So if you have you know, four scans, maybe get rid of two of them that are from three, two years ago. That, at that point, it might be worth getting rid of some. Um, so automation is, um, this is where I had an aha moment. I was like, aha, I, I'm doing something wrong. I'm, taking, I'm spending a lot of time on doing all these recon things. I'm constantly typing the same commands over and over and over, and I'm pretty much driving myself crazy. <laughs> what do I do? Um, so let's think about, the first one is Amazon. So 
Amazon has been on the t news for a very long time about the S3 bucket thing. Amazon's uh, S3 buckets have been on the news. You have heard companies like, I think Verizon was one of them. The U.S. government was another one. Um, just leaving S3 buckets open or the um, access controls were not properly done. So as hackers, what do you do? You go find subdomains or properties that are pointing to an S3 bucket, and you check out and see if those uh, you have read or write access, right? Um, so you can do that manually by going to GitHub or just doing it on Google. You put in the site being s3.amazon.com, and then you put in URL as a company name. You find all those, right? But what if you want to find more and the ones that haven't been indexed on? Uh, if you want to find stuff that hasn't been indexed on Google or GitHub, right? I've looked for those two. I find different results. You start tooling a little bit. So you go back to the old school brute forcing. It's kind of boring, as I said earlier, but it gives you different results. So the one on the left side is a tool that I wrote with a friend of mine called Lazy S3. It's in Ruby. What it does is we give it a two list, and it's constantly putting the, the two keywords around the company name. So if the company name is site.com, it's doing dev, you know, slash, uh, dash site, dash dashboard, and then flipping it putting the, the word at the end, and it's just doing a different, uh, all these different combinations to find different results. If that one doesn't work, there's also another tool. It's the same thing. It's a little bit faster because it's in Bash. Um, my coworker Tom actually wrote this. Pretty much the same thing. You type in backup. Uh, you type in test.com, and so you can backup dash test, test dash backup, test dot backup, test dot site dot com, all these different things you can find. Um, so that's one of the ways to do in uh, your whole automation is finding tools that other people have already ran or writing your own. Search spotter. Uh, same thing, I talked about this earlier. They have a really great, uh, really, really good API. So why not build our tools around this entire thing? It's giving you a list of all these different domains line by line, pretty clean way. So why not perform different tests on every single one of these domains as you're asleep? So you go to bed at 9 p.m., you wake up at 9 a.m., you've scanned about 400 hosts, right? So this is um, how I hit the search spotter API. So you just hit it, you give it the URL that you want, and you get the values for each domain. You pass it to JQ, you clean up the JSON, you pass it to set, you clean it up completely, all the crap that's around it is gone. It goes up the list on the right. But what's next is what makes it more fun. Now you say, hey, I read all those files, I wrote all those <clears throat> domains into the domain.com, whatever, so yahoo.com, for example. Now I want you to open up yahoo.com, which is a text file on this folder, and I want you to write a directory search on every single lines of those of that file. Even better is when you do a uh, screenshot of it, so you don't have to one by one go to these websites and see what they're hosting. Some of them may not even be hosting anything. It could be just an index file. It could be the Apache index file that has nothing on it, right? So based on your experience, you can realize some patterns. Maybe this is a dev site that has an Apache index, but there might be some test folder, dev folder behind it, and you can dig into it deeper. The game changer is when you do all three at once, so you make another alias, you say, hey, call those three other aliases that I made earlier and do these three things. So this was like the very first version of me just being lazy is what it is. Um, so I wrote this tool called Lazy Recon. It's not just this, it does more than just the four aliases, but the majority of it is nmap, directory brute force, get a list of subdomains, and give me as much data as I can. So you can go on GitHub, it's open source, you want to welcome to grab the base version, you can... Uh, Start uh, sending me requests if you want to keep it. Uh, you want to maintain it with me, um, but yeah, it does a lot of cool things. So, for example, for this one, I'm just doing a lazy recon on a company for Nest.com, which is owned by Google. So it's pretty much hitting a different uh, about 15 different sources, and it's pulling out every subdomain. Then it's writing it to a text, and it starts looking at how many of those hosts are actually reachable. So how many of these domains I have found are actually still up or pointing to something. And once it does that, it starts to do a screenshot. For this one, I couldn't do a demo. I picked the wrong target because I had 73,000 URLs to screenshot. At that point, Command-C was my option and just took a screenshot of it. Um, but imagine if, you know, I would have to do 70, 73,000 times of doing directory search, screenshotting, and uh, Nmap. I, would, I think five or six domains in, I would probably give up because there's a lot of uh, different domains to go through. And it generates this HTML report for you, and it's all written in Bash. None of this is on anything fun. It's just purely Bash. It writes an HTML report for you, and 
it does uh, some other commands, you know, it gives you some information about the host, what it's pointing to. Um, I do a lot of fingerprinting, so if I want to find a particular application, I rely on my curl command that I made to this host. It grabs the headers, it's all indexed on the bottom part of the uh, image, where I could just look, for example, if a, if a bug comes out for Jira, for Atlassian, I want to export every single Atlassian uh, instance that I've found, I can just go through all my reports and look for that Jira or whatever uh, tool that I'm using or exploiting and look for that specific header. Uh, digital dumpster diving. I am a pro at it. I have been spending a lot of time more than I should, but at the end of the day, it makes my job a little bit easier. So again, I talked about this last year. You look for elite credentials, usernames, passwords, uh, API keys, uh, headers. Um, you see a pattern. You just keep on looking and you keep digging more and more. Um, we can use tools. I don't use tools because of the fact that even though I may find an empty password parameter, if I go above or beyond that code that had the password, I could find different endpoints, I could find different domains, things that a tool wouldn't probably highlight for me because they're just looking for those password key um, or all these secret keys. So I want to ignore using tools, but it helps. If you don't want, you can, you can run a tool to look for API keys and all these different credentials and also do your manual work if you want to look for different subdomains and applications. So some of the keywords that I use on the right, and then I use different, uh, depending on what the website does or how it looks, I use different uh, keywords on the left. So dev.site.com and so on. So I got 10 minutes. The next one is archive.org. If you haven't watched Mr. Robot, you should. This is an episode when they talk about how they caught someone using uh, the archive.org uh, Wayback Machine. You do the same thing as a hacker. You go to the site, you put in the site's uh, name. It pulls out a, uh, a version of that site from years and years ago. You go through it. You go all through, through all the JavaScript files. You find all the old endpoints that they have been hosting. And some of those endpoints haven't been de deleted. Someone developed it. It's been sitting there. Now, three years later, there's a SQLite in there. You find it. You can exploit it yourself. Uh, there's a tool out there that we wrote. It's called JS Parser. What JS Parser does is you give it a list of JavaScript files. It just highlights all the endpoints for you. So you don't have to go deep all, uh, through all those JavaScript files and start looking them for, um, for yourself. You can just use a tool. Uh, it saves you a lot of time because JavaScript is not the nicest language uh, out there. You can also go to Trello. Um, a lot of companies love putting stuff on Trello, including their FTP password, their pen number for GoDaddy, uh, MySQL password, root, whatever else you want to look for. Just go to Trello.com and you can look for FTP or you can just put the organization name and see what comes up. Uh, so examples, this is where uh, I'm going to, I wanted to get to before this is over. So I talked about transparency, the search transparency, right? Um, this is just simply me looking for a company's name and on Shodan and giving it the port, the default port number for RabbitMQ and then trying admin admin. So that works. And the second one is just going and looking for Jenkins. So I put, I want you to find every instance of the title being dashboard Jenkins on the organization name uh, host.com, which is a company. Um, so that also worked. There was also no auth because they thought because of the fact that the domain is accessible directly, I can't just set the IP address and give it a host name and just retrieve data from it. So that was a fun one. There's also, uh, so there's also, there's an entire article that I wrote about this. You can go to my blog and you can read the whole thing. But at the end of the day, don't leave your Jenkins instances open. Um, hackers are actively looking for it, and that's how a lot of companies are getting owned. So discovering endpoints. This was something that we found on Airbnb.com. Um, this is actually published on our blog. Um, so this is why we wrote JS Parser. At one point, we had a uh, road in. We are like, okay, we can't find any more bugs on Airbnb by just testing the app itself. How do we stay ahead of the game? So we wrote this little tool. Um, we gave it this JavaScript file that popped up on one of the pages. We saw the endpoints, uh, air SMS notification and air push notification. We had no clue what it did. We hit it a couple of different times. The good thing about it was the API gave you errors of like, hey, you're doing something wrong. You need this parameter. Um, so we actually fuzz it a little bit. There were some limitations. You're sending an SMS, you know, you, you they throttle it. Versus if you do a push notification to your phone, there's no limits. So it was easier to exploit that. What we ended up doing was we figured out what the post request looked like. We started enumerating the object ID and the user ID. And we ended up getting all the templates for it because it was giving us the errors. And we had every single one of them until we were able to send ourselves a notification. So instead of just enumerating stuff, we said, OK, let's just solve our, send ourselves a new object ID to our user ID, title it test, and give it the body test. That worked. So now let's try and see if we can change that user ID and get some other user ID's push notification. That also worked. So we were able to just give it a different ID um, using our user ID, giving a different object ID, and it was sending us a push notification um, because they were not checking if that user ID owned this object, right? 
Um, so those are things we can do to stay ahead of the game. When we exploited this and we asked Airbnb about, hey, did you know about this? They also weren't aware that there was a notif there was a new endpoint going out. That was because we were actively monitoring all the JavaScript files and pulling out endpoints that they may have even not known about it yet. That was just into going into development. The next one is uh, doing the dumpster diving thing on GitHub. Uh, so I find an up umbrella company. So you know, example, Google owns Nest. So I looked up Google and Nest together, and then I find this really weird. FTP thing that has you know some you know provided that we're using some username and then some password that actually got me access to this giant company's FTP server that was hosting all their backups and that resulted in 10k that was uh, a week before Christmas so Christmas was really fun that year um, oh, sorry that was a week after Christmas almost sorry um, but yeah it was a really fun Christmas and when I got paid I think uh, I was screaming very loudly um, the next one is this is happening a lot. You just look for FTP and site.com. Um, different you, know, you can change those parameter names like FTP, SFTP, SSH, root, whatever you want to look for. And it just keeps on happening. Um, we talked about the S3 bucket things. Uh, this was actually reported to us on HackerOne. It's publicly available. You can go read it online on hackerone.com slash activity. But pretty much they found an S3 bucket that was owned by us. They went to Amazon, read the CLI documentation, and used the CLI just to see if they can list the bucket. That worked. Then they did the same thing with writing. They were also able to write to it. So if you're doing these things quickly and fast enough, you'll be the first to find them, and you can get boundaries like this one. This one was worth $2,500. Um, there was top number takeovers. There's times when engineers make S3 buckets. They forget to point it to the place where it's supposed to be pointing to. You catch those. You go to Amazon.com and you grab it and you claim it. And now you can do whatever you want on there. XSS, phishing, whatever that is. This is what probably the, my most favorite bug. Um, so this is the whole package. How do you do all these things that I've been uh, going really fast about? How do you put them all together? So I find this asset. It's something something that dev the target dot com. Uh, I find an endpoint that's internal. My interest peaked, so I couldn't find a lot of documentation online. Obviously, this is supposed to be for their company. So what do I do? I go on GitHub, and I just plug in the domain, and I find this little piece of information. It tells me, hey, there's a COS folder with V1 dashboard, internal login, and this is what, the, what it's looking for. So use that information, and I find another employee of this company who had leaked the same information, but what they forgot to redact from it was a... Header. So the header says preferred authentication is to be internal, and then the next to the internal thing has an auth token. So you didn't have to have a login for it. All you had to do was add these two headers to the request, and you can actually reset someone's machine on there. So it gives me, as you guys can't really see it, but in this corner, when next to the root, it says OK, when I had a reset, uh, reboot endpoint. And I ended up uh, hitting, I found an endpoint through the JavaScript files. I pretty much went to the index for the internal folder. It was a login page. I pulled the JavaScript files and looked for more endpoints. And one of them was internal something something that actually allowed me to uh, hit an internal account. So it gave me a list of all the LDAP usernames that I could use to brute force and probably escalate my work. So that also resulted in a pretty nice bounty of $5,000. Um, yeah, so this was... I'm glad that I was actually able to get this done in 30 minutes. Again, I'm Ben. Uh, you can reach me out on Twitter on uh, at Nahamsek. Uh, you can check out all of our directory, hacker, uh, the, all the programs on Hacker One at directory. If you want to email me, you can email me on either one of those addresses. Uh, we're also hiring, so if you're looking for a cool company to work for, you can go to hackerone.com/careers. Um, I'm also doing a training at AppSec USA, so if you're going to be down in San Jose, if you can't afford to go to San Jose, I'm doing a full-blown training on everything like this, three days from recon to exploitation. Um, and this is all the tools that I've uh, shown you guys that I pretty much use. Some of them are written by myself, some are written with other people. And a big thank you for you guys uh, letting me talk, the presenters here and the organizers. Also, some friends, Zaya, Tom Dev, IT Security, John, Luke, Smeagles, Yobert, and Mikhail, who have helped me put some of these slides together. Thanks. We do have two minutes, so if you guys have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Yes? How much of this have you, like, playbook down? So, like, automated? Because obviously, the more plays you can hit, the more things you can I like to spend, I like to waste a lot of time doing stuff manually. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the things that uh, Lazy S3 is the base version that I use. 
Um, I built a little bit on top of it, but majority of people aren't focused on, I mean, for me at least, I'm not focused on making this better. I'm more focused on adding stuff to my dictionary or the word list that I'm using. So if I find interesting endpoints on GitHub, I'm mainly going and adding it to my directory uh, brute force list so I, can, so I won't miss on the next target, right? Any other questions? Cool, thank you.